It's working. Hello, hello, hello. Gosh, there's a lot of you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Obviously, this is the last one between, between you and beer, so we'll try to keep this as short as possible. Um, welcome to our talk. So today, uh, Guy and I, we, we were talking about how we might uh, pitch our talk about Cube, to, to KubeCon. Um, and we kind of agreed that the vendor talks are great, right? They're, they're, they're good, you learn a lot. But actually, the thing that brings us to conferences is the war stories, right? We like to hear from customers, we like to hear from companies um, who actually talk about the things that they do in production. And, and the failure states that they, they, they've seen in production. Because we learn from it, they learn from it, it's great. So that, that was our pitch. We decided to take the second biggest outage revenue-wise of Skyscanner and present it to you all, right? Bare bones and everything. We're just going to talk about it. We're going to talk about how we got there. Uh, we're going to talk about the actual technical failures, the, the cultural failures, all, all the big muck-ups. Um, with the idea that this is essentially three, free therapy for us, right? We're, yeah, you, we've got 20 minutes of you guys just, uh, you guys got just sitting listening to us, and uh, we get to talk about it. And if you learn something from it, then it means uh, it's less of a failure, right? You've got something from it, we've got something from it. It's a data point rather than a failure. But before we go any further, ah, right, I need this. Thanks, guy. Okay. Um, we should introduce ourselves. I'm the top one. My name's Stuart Davidson. I'm a director uh, of engineering at Skyscanner. Um, I run the production platform Tribe, which is an entity, uh, a, team, a group of squads that um, run almost like a, a platform as a service. So we run all the, infra the kind of uh, compute, traffic routing, observability, um, incident management, everything, everything that our product teams use to get their product across the globe. And, and we, we do all the kind of heavy lifting underneath. Uh, and I'm Guy Templeton. Can you, can you hear Guy? Don't no, all right. This is Guy Templeton. He is the, the, the lead Kubernetes engineer for Skyscanner. He's also the, the co-lead of um, the SIG autoscaling um, here. So that, that's him there. Oh, no, but there you go. All right, this is Skyscanner. Now, some of you might not know what Skyscanner is. Skyscanner is a website that puts together a bunch of flights, hotels, and car hire from about 1,200 travel partners uh, across the globe and you want to go somewhere, maybe multiple places at once, or in, in a kind of a, a holiday, we put together them all, all, all together for the cheapest possible price. To give you a sense of the scale of Skyscanner, we serve, at the moment, I think it was last month, we serve about 75 million unique customers a month. Okay, So that, that gives you a sense of the size and scale of, of the website that we're talking about. Today, we're going to go through three different, different areas. I'm going to talk about Skyscanner's cloud native journey, right? So how did we get from the data centers, um, and a, not a small amount of users, but a, a far less amount of users, to where we are just before the incident? Guy's going to talk to you about the incident and actually the failure state and how we recovered it. And then we're going to go through it together and talk about some of the learnings, because that's ultimately what you're here for, right? We're going to give you some context. Then you're going to get the learnings. Hopefully, we'll have lots of time for questions as well. So please think about these questions. This is a chance for you to learn from us, for us to learn from you. So this is a, a deliberate attempt for us to share some information. It's maybe not the best forum for it, but there's beers after this, so we can do it there. Skyscanner's cloud native journey. So I, I joined Skyscanner um, in 2015, so it was about seven, eight years ago. And at that time, we had about one million, just less than one million users a month. Then we got to 10 million users a month. And just before COVID hit, we were over 100 million users a month. So that's 10x and then 10x again. And it has been a wild journey, right? <laughs> the, the, the number of pieces of infrastructure, the number of uh, systems that you trusted in that had never failed in years suddenly became bottlenecks, suddenly became uh, things that wouldn't scale the way you needed it to, or suddenly added latency, or, or some sort of, uh, I don't know, problem that you hadn't foreseen. So it, it's been a really fun journey, kind of iterating and iterating and re-establishing what you're going to do and thinking about it from be, almost the ground up several times along the way. Um, we started off in data centers, like, like everyone, I, I guess, uh, 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 we're what, uh, about 15 years old as a company. So we were in data centers. We had five data centers across the globe. 
And uh, yeah, we made this shift to the public cloud. We saw the potential of the public cloud. You can see, you know, we were scaling so quickly that actually buying infrastructure and getting it plugged in and things like that just wasn't sustainable. Um, and we saw the opportunity of allowing our teams to decide on their own for infrastructure and all the benefits of infrastructure's code and that sort of thing. So we made this shift to the cloud. Now, I say that in one sentence, one bullet point, as if it was a simple transition. But um, we are still paying the price of our migration from the data centers to the cloud even yet, right? So at one point, we just decided to not renew our data center contract. That's how it, it took us such a long time to transition the workloads from a data center native into a cloud native solution with all the, the fun and games of auto scaling and, and, uh, and failure states and such. So uh, we lifted and shifted a, a ton of our workloads and we're still paying that technical debt off at the moment. But we're in AWS fully now. So that's, that's our cloud provider. We are fully AWS. At the same time, uh, around sort of 2015, 2016, this thing called Docker was starting to happen. And it, it was at the time where people in conference talks like this would say, who here's heard of Docker? And people would go, oi. And they were like, who's using it in production? They'd go, oh, 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 oh no. Um, like it, it was just about that time where it was all quite exciting, but we hadn't quite decided what we we're going to do with it. Skyscanner decided to try it out with our CI solution, right? So it, it's quite a, a, a common kind of first step to try a container native CI solution. It was actually the precursor to Harness. It was a thing called Drone.io. It's an open source solution, container native. Um, and we really started to see the benefit of ephemeral build agents that the squads could define, right? Instead of release engineers mucking around with Team City agents and Ansible scripts and things like that, squads could define their own uh, ephemeral build agents in containers and do their own builds. We thought this was great. It was groundbreaking to Skyscanner. And that was one of the, the real drivers to us starting to talk about using containers really pretty early on in production. We had a look at a bunch of options at that time, and there was loads of container schedulers at that time. Um, and we decided, because we're moving into AWS, we would go all in, and we would use ECS. And this was the grand plan for our ECS right, uh, solution. So we, we asked squads to define in YAML uh, the configuration of their service. And then we would point our, our internal uh, tool called Slingshot at um, each Git repo. And from there, we would deploy a Route 53 entry um, behind an ELB, uh, in front of an ELB, sorry. And then we would deploy containers just by adding them and removing them from the ELB. Nothing more complicated than that. Again, this was totally groundbreaking. Like it, it totally revolutionized how Skyscanner was doing things. Because it used to be that services and squads would have to talk to the release engineering team. They would get their Ansible scripts updated. They would, uh, they would actually have a release engineer who's like, have you done your tests? Well, et cetera, et cetera. With this, it was all self-service, right? So squads could just deploy the services without engaging with release engineering. And it got to this crazy state where we didn't actually know which services were being deployed. It was quite, kind of a bit scary for the release engineering team. And our OKR was uh, like get eight services deployed on Slingshot. And we ended up with like 62 by the end of the month. And our OKR stats for the, for the month and the quarter were like thousands of percent. It was brilliant. Um, but this really kind of progressed our, our uh, path along using containers into production. And it, it made a, it was, ah, what, what's the main, it was so important because squads could deploy with confidence. Right? That was, that was the, the main takeaway from it. They could deploy with confidence. And it, it moved it away from being this really scary, really uh, difficult process with lots of human interaction. It became this uh, ubiquitous thing that just happened in the background. Like squads could deploy several times a day. And it, it, almost, it became a strategic enabler. Right? People used deployments to get out of trouble rather than causing trouble. And it, it, just, it, was, it was such a big change for Skyscanner. ECS took us a long way. And in fact, we still use ECS to this day. Almost, almost we're out of ECS. But we were finding that we were having to rebuild a lot of components that we were seeing happening in the open source community. And we decided to take on Kubernetes. We thought, this is the, the way forward. Now, again, there was a lot of schedulers at the time, but Kubernetes had quite a strong ecosystem. As demonstrated here, it's continued that, that journey. Um, and uh, we, we went through many, many iterations of, of trying to get Kubernetes to work. Like I say, we haven't 
fully got all our services into Kubernetes yet. There are still some on ECS. Our first iteration, we got a consultant in, and we spent a lot of money on it. And it was at a time, again, where no one really knew how to run Kubernetes at scale. So they learned a lot, we learned a lot. Um, and ultimately, the solution that we, we ended up with at the end didn't last about, a, it was about a month, a month and a half before we started to see problems as our workloads grew. Then we iterated and we started, uh, we, we did this sky, typical Skyscanner thing of the time. Because we'd built so much in ECS, we started to rebuild and build custom solutions on top of Kubernetes rather than leveraging the open source community that was one of the main selling points for Kubernetes. And uh, again, we, we went through several iterations of Kubernetes, uh, kind of, I guess, architectures at that time. <laughs> it, it, it got to a point where we got some critical workloads onto Kubernetes, but we had enormous clusters. Like we had one cluster per region. We were in four regions. We had one cluster per region. And these clusters were enormous. Um, well, what we thought was enormous. I mean, we, we had the keynote by CERN, right? They, they're enormous. We, we thought we were enormous at the time. And, but because it was a single cluster, it meant the f any failure, the failure mode, like any sort of slight failure, the whole thing went down. And we had one particular outage um, where the business asked us to slow down, stop changing things in Kubernetes, right? Stop upgrading Kubernetes. Well, we can't. The, the, the upgrade path of Kubernetes is like a, a re-release every 12 to 14 weeks, right? So we couldn't slow down. And that's just the core version of Kubernetes, right? You've got all the, the different components, different parts of the Kubernetes uh, architecture. So we couldn't slow down. And I, I remember st I was about to go on stage at uh, uh, GitHub Satellite, and I was about to talk about our continuous deployment system and how rapid iteration reduces risk, and like that's the way we wanted to go forward in Skyscanner. Um, but Paul Gillespie, who's our senior te tech in, uh, in production platform, he phoned me and he said, look, we've just had this big outage. Not this one we're about to talk about. Uh, we had another outage. Um, and the business really wants us to slow down. But I couldn't advocate, I couldn't say, let's slow down. And then literally 20 minutes later, go on stage and say, we should go fast because it reduces risk. So I said to Paul, look, there needs to be a different way. We need to approach this in a different fashion. Is there, is there any other way of doing this? So all credit to Paul, and all credit to Guy, and all credit to Guy's team. We went back to basics, and we started again. And we started to reevaluate all the technologies that we were using, and actually which ones were valuable, and try and declutter all the different things we'd installed in our Kubernetes architecture. We, uh, there's a really good book called Good Strategy, Bad Strategy, and I, I really recommend you read it. If you've ever tried to do a strategy, someone will ask you to do a strategy. Um, I really recommend you read it because it starts with the diagnoses. So what's wrong, right? So let's start with what's wrong. Not the solutions, but the diagnoses of the problems. And one of our big problems was that we weren't using industry standards. I talked about that. So we decided specifically to set a policy of moving to industry standards. Um, Guy will talk a bit more about that, uh, about this bit. But we started to adopt, like I say, more open standards, more open, uh, more open tooling uh, technologies. But the big fundamental shift was a move to a, a cellular architecture. So this is what our architecture looks like in, in terms of Kubernetes uh, at the moment. What we decided to do was to, to look at the failure states um, that we had to work with and create an architecture around that. So in this particular case, this, we, this isn't actually well named. That's a cluster, not a cell. OK, sorry about that. That's my, that's my fault. So these are different clusters. There's, a cell per region. And within a cell, there are many clusters. We have a, a, an even amount of uh, clusters per AZ. And we, each workload is n plus 2 clusters big to allow one cluster to be down for maintenance or upgrade, and one cluster to be down for a failure state of any sort. And even then, 100% of the, the work, the um, requests coming through should be served. By, by our architecture. Now, this has an amazing benefit. Beyond being a really resilient architecture, one that's other than the one we're about to talk about, uh, hasn't cost us, caused us a production incident. Um, we use spot instances 100% in production. So our entire compute infrastructure is spot. And that has saved us literally millions of dollars. 
The company has been saved millions of dollars because of this resilience. If our nodes are taken out because of uh, spot termination, we've got that resilience. We can deal with the failure state really easily. It's part, it's ingrained. It's part of the, the actual default state. Um, so this is, this is the state where we're in. Now, what actually happened, right? So pride cometh before a fall. I've just told you that the cells architecture is the best architecture ever, ever, ever. And at 9.52 and 33 seconds on the 25th of August, there was an engineering all hands. And it was a really good question because we'd moved about 70% of our workloads into the cells architecture. And I was asked the question why, uh, by, by another team that hadn't moved yet, why was it a good idea to move the cells architecture? And I said, well, it's the traditional theory of constraints, bottlenecks, but we have solved the compute problem. It is now the most available, resilient thing. We're going to move, move to a different bottleneck, which at that point was traffic routing. And the solution for traffic routing will be based on cells, so you should move. But cells has fixed the availability problem. At 15.53, not one day, no, it was the same day, we, <laughs> Argo CD deleted every service in every cluster, in every region across the globe, ultimately, because we told it to. <laughs> Guy. Thank you. So, how did we go from, can you hear me yet? No. No? 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 Yeah, 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 that yeah, sounds good. Good job. Awesome. So, how did, how did we go from 478 services running, serving travelers, to zero? Um, and it, asshole, good stories do. It's a no op change. Just merge this late on the day. Um, and this is the change that killed Skyscanner. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, as you can see, removed some ginger brackets. Um, what could possibly go wrong? So very quickly, soon after that, rather than seeing our lovely homepage and being able to search for uh, flights, accommodation, car hire, people instead didn't even see this nice error page. Instead, they saw this. <laughs> <laughs> which it's not the greatest traveler experience it turns out and people get very confused as to why they're not uh, getting access denied for their flights um, and very quickly someone uh, was able to guess what had happened um, and was smelling Istio mesh because we use Istio we have MTLS we use authorization policies and uh, when we deleted everything Istio started going no you're not allowed to call anything um, so in terms of what actually happened though, um, going back to what Stuart mentioned, we have uh, Slingshot, our deployment tooling, um, for reasons when we moved to, when we started moving to Kubernetes, we went, we don't want our developers to have to relearn tooling or uh, create, completely change their uh, application uh, specification. So we kept the same Slingshot.yaml format and just added on Kubernetes support. So they could add a few different fields and now, instead of being deployed to ECS, they were getting deployed to Kubernetes for free. Um, however, that meant we were in a weird in-between state. And this is where the trouble uh, originated, because we, were, we had some things which we'd moved to the industry standards of GitOps, and then we had all of the things that users deployed onto the cluster that people care about, things like deployment, services, HPAs, and service monitors. Meanwhile, GitOps is deploying things like SDO objects, resource quotas, but critically, namespaces, uh, which means that GitOps is controlling something that contains things which are not GitOps controlled. So in terms of how, how that works, um, for those who aren't familiar with GitOps, um, I'm assuming most will be, but we have a re uh, repository where people declare like their service and onboard it and say which cells they want to deploy to, uh, what, what, how many resources, how many pods they'll have, what resources look like that. So we can do some of the templating of like resource quotas to prevent runaway scaling, et cetera, for users. And then Argo CD is, is responsible for doing that Helm chart templating based on the values and then charts uh, defined in the repo and then applies them to the clusters. So if we go back to this, this one line change, what this is, is being used for by Argo is 
telling it what clusters to apply all, to all of these objects to. So multiple layers of templating. This, this becomes, uh, for Argo, the driver of what applications do you need to diff against the cluster and apply to the cluster. Uh, so when this became a invalid thing, it suddenly is going, oh, I don't need to apply any objects to any cluster. Oh, there's a lot of objects there that I don't need. I'm going to delete those now. <laughs> um, so in terms of our recovery, that, that meant that we had GitOps, nice, easy, revert the PR, all of our namespaces are back. But all of those objects that people care about, like deployments and uh, services, are not back, um, which is a bit painful. So in terms of the recovery, uh, we had to first mitigate. So we got people our nice error page so that they could at least see you know, a traveler with a surfboard instead of an R back error. Then we had uh, prioritizing getting a single region functional and then uh, also shed non-critical load. So things like price alerts for travelers where we want to prioritize getting um, users quotes for their travel or um, information about the tickets they've already bought. But price alerts we can, we can do without for a couple of days. So this is a graph of the namespaces. And you can see very obviously where we deleted everything and how we reverted things and Argo CD slowly sort of started going, oh, wait, I've got thousands of objects to reapply here. Um, but you'll see that's, that's a very short gap like un definitely under an hour for some clusters to recover. However, this is the traffic graph for Skyscanner, effectively, over that time period. And you can see that outage is far longer and is pretty choppy um, to recovering to basically normal levels afterwards. So in terms of why that took so long, that's, that's the other bits of restoring clusters. Um, and that's, that's far tougher, because it was manual recovery. We had dusty run books that were designed for not a cluster where we deleted all the services but kept the same cluster, but instead a cluster where we'd, we'd just wiped out, uh, deleted the entire cluster, spun up a new cluster, and restored. Um, and we also discovered that our run books were not easy to follow when a stressed engineer is trying to copy and paste. Like, these two blocks are very similar and make it very easy to copy and paste the wrong thing when so you might be trying to restore the wrong cl etcd cluster so this is this is what the recovery looked like of the actual services so this is the number of services running on each cluster and you can see here we've got this like stepped recovery as we did the manual restore in each uh, each cluster so eventually get back to a point where we left it overnight, where actually that, the strength of that cell-based architecture, we were able to serve all of Skyscanner's critical traveler traffic out of just four clusters in a single region and able to allow our uh, support engineers to get a proper night's sleep before they resumed recovering the next day. So what, can we, what have we learned from it? What can you learn from it? The, the, the risk here came from us crossing this chasm between we want to get from where we were to using all these standard tools. We want to get all GitOps. We want to be fully based in that world. But we are in an in-between state where we've actually caused potentially more risk for ourselves by still being in that state where GitOps can cause a complete outage, but then GitOps can't be used to resolve all of the outage. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we provided Argo CD the power to apply all these Helm charts, um, and it, it used that power and deleted everything. Uh, finally, templates, templates with logic are actually code. Like, we, we made a single uh, line change to a templating file and managed to wipe out the entire uh, cluster. This wasn't caught at um, PR time because we don't have tests on it, because it's just a template. Why would you write tests for that? Um, especially when you've got multiple layers of templating, I would recommend trying to find a way to test that and make sure that what you're changing does what you think it does. 
Um, and this may, may seem obvious, but don't do global config deploys. Um, since, since we had this outage, we have made a change so that uh, even changes to templating like that will only ever roll out to a small subset of clusters at a time so that theoretically we can only, still only take uh, down a single cluster. I mean, I'm now worried that I'm going to get paged and get told that all of the clusters have yeah, gone yeah. down again. Yeah, yeah, because you just said it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's my turn. Can you switch my mic on? Yeah. Can you hear me? Excellent, excellent. Right, um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly talk about um, another part of the less technical side of this, right? So Guy talked about the technical solution, the change that was made to the file that, that was at, right at the root. It was the root file of our templating. And the engineer that made the change, he, he was an experienced engineer, right? He was an experienced engineer, and he made a change that, oh, I, I don't know, it, looking at it, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty easy one to miss. And it also got PR'd, like, sorry, it, it got reviewed by a very senior engineer and they missed it as well. Now, the, the title of our talk was how a couple of characters brought down our site. That's a bit tongue in cheek. It's a couple of characters in terms of the curly braces. It's also a couple of characters as in people, right? It was a, it was a bit, of, bit of a joke. Yeah, it's a bit, okay, it's not a great one. <laughs> Skyscanner really works hard at having a blameless attitude to incidents, right? Humans are fallible. They make mistakes. Everyone does it. And that's why the sales architecture is so important to us, because it allows people to make mistakes. Now, we thought we'd got all the failure states, and we thought we'd put all the guardrails in place. But like Guy says, we didn't apply testing to our, to our templating, and we did global deploys in a way that we never thought possible. That root file hadn't changed in like three years. Um, so it was a failure state that we hadn't considered, but we know that humans fail. So when it actually came to the incident management side of things, that's where I genuinely believe Skyscanner shone because everyone that was response, that needed to come to the response of what had happened, and that's not just engineers. We're talking legal, we're talking user satisfaction teams, we're to, that like the CEO, et cetera, et cetera. Like everybody came into a room, um, other than the CXOs, that, that's not fair, the CEO wasn't, the VP of Eng did pop in for a little while and then left to let the engineers get on with fixing the problem rather than figuring out who made the mistake. Now, we still know who made the mistake, but we've not talked about it in any ILBs, uh, incident learning documents, uh, which is what we do after an incident and how we got some of these ret uh, reflections and retrospectives. Um, but it really wasn't valuable because everybody moved in one direction to fix the problem rather than trying to cover their asses and trying to cover up what went wrong, which would ultimately delay the resolving of this problem. Now, I got a couple of quotes from engineers. Now, the, Everybody was tired and quite emotional, so these quotes are a little bit um, emotional, but I think they're awesome. Like Guy says, we actually, because of the architecture, we got to send everybody home really pretty early on, about 11 o'clock at night. But people were tired because it, it happened 4 o'clock in the afternoon. People had had a full working day, and then they had to resolve this problem. Full outage. But, yeah, like the, the positivity and calmness to give us the space to triage and recover. Like, these quotes are, are, to me, really inspirational, and I, I share them with you not to big us up, but to try and advocate to you the sense of achievement of that blameless culture. Right, so try it. Try it in your organization. Next time you have a problem, don't look at who, just look at what. Just, just leave it out. Don't even talk about the person. You don't need to. It's not, it's not important. Failures happen. Um, so yeah, I, I know I'm starting to bang on about it a little bit, but I, I thought it was important. Folks, thank you for your attention. I, I know it's maybe one of the shorter talks, but we're really keen to hear some questions if you've got any, any things you want to ask. Thank you. Uh, I mean, we were kind of hoping someone would... There, there, there's a question down there, but I don't yeah, know if there's a microphone. We're, we're kind of hoping there was somebody with a mic. Yeah. Is there someone with a mic? A... Yeah. All right. Tell you what, mate. You, 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 you. No. Yeah. Thanks, Carlos. Thanks. Um. Uh. Hey. First of all, th thanks for sharing. Uh, failure stories are always uh, interesting. So, uh, uh, actually, I have two questions. The first one is about um, 
you mentioned that uh, uh, never uh, you should never uh, configure global uh, configurations. Do we have uh, so, uh, stages, different stagings for GitOps? And the second one is about maybe do you have a disaster recovery procedure to maybe create a new region at regular intervals? Uh, so, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the rollouts, yeah, we, we have a concept that we call channels. Um, so, we have uh, different clusters in different channels. So, we have effectively a dev, alpha, beta, and main. Um, and uh, effectively, at PR time, we enforce that changes only roll out to a, a given channel, a, a single channel at a time, um, so that we effectively cannot roll out global changes. Um, I, I am sure there is some way and somehow that we could could uh, cause it to happen. Um, we've tried to catch everything we we could. Um, so yeah, we, we, we basically progress changes through those channels. We have different testing mechanisms as well. Um, yeah, there was quite a, a, an argument, um, quite a debate about do you want to separate each region and have like a separate Argo CD and a separate infrastructure for each region. And it's that balance of like efficiency against that blast radius. And ultimately, we have, we have stuck with the single um, instance of Argo CD to, to roll out the different regions. But like Guy says, we've got the different um, files. Um, in terms of your regional question, in terms of rolling out a new region, um, because we're in four regions, we, we haven't got a, a sort of hit this button and roll out a brand new region. Um, but because we're in four regions, we're comfortable deploying to multiple regions. So if that were to happen, obviously there's a couple of layers under the cells architecture in terms of AWS and such, um, but all that's infrastructure as code. So I think we could do it pretty quickly if, if forced. Um, maybe we should run a war game on it, right? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's certainly something that we theoretically could, but it probably wouldn't be our first option. Cool. Sorry, Matt, we'll get to you next. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, great talk. Do you ever do any DR, like uh, drills about like recovery from things like this? Because that seems uh, potentially like something that no one ever yeah. drills for like total outage. But you know, what happens if suddenly everything was to get deleted? How quickly can you get back up? Like, is that worth even drilling? What do you guys think? <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> it's really challenging, right? How much time do you spend on a disaster recovery? But also, a backup isn't a backup until you've restored it. Um, so there's definitely a, a kind of a, 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 I guess, a, what am I trying to say? Um, challenge there, friction there, right? Um, we have done, subsequently, we have done far more disaster recoveries than we have in the past, particularly security-based ones. We've done, we've done some really good stuff with our security tribe and gone, OK, a malicious actor has come in and switched this off. What do you do? Um, and some of those um, kind of theoretical scenarios. You don't need infrastructure. You don't need the, the um, chaos engineering or anything like that to actually run through that. All it was was a PowerPoint deck and some you know, uh, sugared up actors that kind of went, oh, no, there's things that are wrong. <laughs> and that was actually a lot of fun. And we, we spent an afternoon doing that. So that was pretty cheap. Um, but even during the back, do, do you want to talk about the, the backup issue that we had? Yeah. yeah. So as, as I mentioned, we, we had a run book for doing uh, restores of etcd. Um, at the time, we were using COPS to manage our clusters, so we, we had the etcd clusters. Um, but like uh, as I mentioned, we, we had practiced restoring it, but only ever onto completely fresh clusters, where we imagined the entire cluster had been deleted. We hadn't imagined this as the potential scenario where we were trying to effectively roll etcd back in time, um, which did show up some, some flaws in the run book and some assumptions where we'd, we'd made incorrect assumptions. So we had to do some on the fly uh, yep. stuff. We have, we have since moved to EKS. We're using Valero now as, as the backup tool for that. Um, and we, we are validating those um, more often. Like we covered these, these scenarios and know how, know how it would behave in both scenarios of a fresh cluster and a, a cluster that is in a, a like a bad state. But there was also an instance to do with IAM policies. So we, we, we had restored a bunch of stuff. The guy will go into what? Um, but then security did an audit of our IAM policies and locked them all down. So getting access to the backup suddenly became an issue, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to on the fly discover why, um, 
cops had uh, created or, or had not cleaned up old I am uh, old backups. So we were stuck <laughs> listing thousands upon thousands upon thousands of objects, trying to go. No, just give give me that. I don't I don't want you to li carry on listing. I just want you to restore. That was um, the I am policy had removed the ability yeah. to delete the deltas, yeah. so we had like hundreds of deltas rather than six, which was yeah. meant to be the policy. And um, so there's definitely things like that that will always catch you. I, uh, yeah, it's, what, what extent do you, do, you, do you go to, right? right. Car Carlos, can this gentleman, he put his hand up first, so we'll grab him. Yeah, so as far as recovery is concerned, what is the first thing you do when, once, you, once you saw that you are running zero services? Did you just revert the commit and rerun the, the CD? Or? So we, we, yeah, we immediately reverted the PR um, and one of the one of the um, joys of the, the blameless incident culture was we had someone who who is not an engineer involved in like the actual service who took on an incident commander role so that freed and they were doing the coordination between squads so that freed my squad to do the the revert and start figuring out how do we restore things um, whilst another a member of another squad the traffic routing squad inside Skyscanner was able to do the 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 fix of like. Let's, let's send people to a static error page until we have services back. Yeah, um, that, that incident commander role is really important. And there's a lot, there's some new incident management tools out there that are kind of slack based and they drive this attitude of having an incident commander who's not doing anything technical and is dealing with the comms to the CXOs and the legal department, because the legal department had to be told and like Twitter, like our, our um, social media teams and things like that, they, they were dealing with that so that the technical teams could get on with fixing the technical issues. Why did it take three hours to restore the traffic? <laughs> because of those those issues that we we mentioned in terms of like cops, etc. Um, it took us it took it took us time to uh, we had to dust off the run book. We had to figure out exact like was a restore going to actually fix all of the services we need like. We, there, was, there was a bit of, um, the, there had to be a discussion in terms of like what was the best way to approach all of that restore. Um, so yeah, that was, that was largely the, the lag there. And the restore, because the clusters were quite big, um, the, the restores were not the fastest either. Well, one of, my, one of the favorite things that one of my engineers said, shout out to Caitlin, she says, before you make a big decision, have a, go and make a cup of tea. <laughs> right, because if you make a quick decision in a situation like that, you can make it worse, a lot worse. And then there was at one point we were like, this is going to take days. Because like Guy says, GitOps replaced all the namespaces. But then how do we deploy each service? And that was actually going, like, do we have to talk to each squad and figure it out? So there was definitely a moment of time where we stopped and went, right, what, what is it we're trying to do and what is the quickest way of doing it? Rather than going, just do that. So, yeah, it saved us days, but it did cost us, you know, time. Can you talk about your data persistence? I'm here. Yeah, hi. Um, can you talk about data persistence? Um, how much are you doing in the cluster and how much outside? You, you've mentioned restore, but that sounded like etcd restore to me. Um, but then other data persistence for your services. So we currently only run um, stateless uh, workloads in our Kubernetes clusters. Um, everything stateful is pretty much an AWS managed service, um, RDS, Elastic Ash, um, Whatever it may be, um, the the one thing we do is uh, we have um, Prometheus, but in in those cases it was we we have those um, we had some EBS volume snapshotting I think as well. Um, the, but again, we, we I think we just ended up discarding the data because we went it's metric data. Like we have Thanos for long term retention it's generally metrics about a time when we've not had any traffic on the cluster. So it was, it was again, one of those things where we, we had the discussion and went, is it worth the time to try and do that? No, let's, let's move on and uh, do the restores of more regions. Yeah, and, and you're right, you know, it's the, it's the third rail, right? How do you deal with stateful services? Um, but in our case, such a large proportion of our services are stateless. So we're, we're benefiting from spot instances on Kubernetes and saving a lot of money doing it. When it comes to stateful services, we take a different approach and we, we leverage AWS far more.
Thank you to Carlos for this, by the way. He's just taking this on. We're not quite sure why there's not a track host or someone that's doing the questions, but thanks, Carlos. <laughs> Hi. Um, just wondering if you had any cluster after scalers that just annihilated your nodes and you had to start from like five nodes or something? <laughs> Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think the cluster autoscalers ever uh, done that to us, he says. Famous last words. Um, we have, I think we have had misbehaving HPAs. Um, yes. There used to be bugs in the HPA where it would happily scale some things down when one metric said and the other metrics were unavailable, um, <laughs> which yep. led to, like, I, I think a Prometheus outage led to some services being scaled down, which was, was less than ideal shall we say. Yeah. Um, once we realized we, we managed to get a patch in upstream, but we also, like, as soon as we restored Prometheus, it scaled back up. But. So, uh, eventually, how did you get to test a template on your cases? Um, did you do some another cluster? Uh, so we uh, have, um, we, we effectively have test values that we, we now use for templating. So effectively, if people are um, changing templating, the, the idea is that we, we will drive that, um, the test values through that templating engine and check against the, uh, an expected output. Yeah, U unit testing, yeah. that actual unit. Treat it like yeah. code, so yeah. it needs unit tests. Um. Hey, um, so if you use purely spot, instances, have you got a backup plan for the unlikely event that there's not enough spot instances to handle all of your traffic? <laughs> Interesting you say that at, at, at this moment in time with an AWS person in the room as well. Uh, yes, we, well, we, we use, we have a diverse range of instance types, like we, we use the cluster autoscaler and autoscaling group still, so we, we do need to revisit those, those instance mixes as new instances are launched, add them into the potential um, pool. It, effectively, if we needed to, we could change all of our autoscaling groups to, to on-demand instead yeah. of spot. We've, um, we've also moved traffic to different regions, yeah. right? So EU Central One had a problem last, last year, sort of October time, where I, I'm, going to, I'm going to raise my fist at CERN again. I, I think they were, well, no, it wasn't CERN, but every so often CERN will take all the uh, spot instances from EU Central 1 and they're like, where's our... But um, yeah, we shifted traffic to EU West 1 um, and that, that saves us a lot of problems. I mean, we've got a lot of savings plans and things like that that we, we can set up node groups where we're using reserved instances and we have done that in the past, but um, because we use such a diverse range of different spot instance types, we can get away with it. Um, and we haven't really been in a situation where we've needed to like 100% move to on-demand. We have used on-demand when, when there's big peaks as well. Wow, we filler, <laughs> filibustered you. <laughs> um, I only put my hand up because it's kind of related. So it was more just a question to both of you because of Skyscanner. Yeah. Um, I know you guys have, is it TurboLift? Yes. Yep. Oh, Did TurboLift okay. help with any of these <laughs> things? Or was that, because I, when I saw the title of the, the, the presentation, yeah. I was kind of going, was it TurboLift? <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, TurboLift just mass PR to everyone's GitHub repos, but. It does, I, yeah, well, no, after you, sir. I, 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 um, so it was one of the things we were considering when we thought, are we going to have to redeploy everything? Um, like. Do, do we need to use TurboLift to like raise PRs against all the repos in Skyscanner and tell them to deploy to different clusters, et cetera? Um, but uh, like we, we sat down, had that conversation, and went, uh, I, we, we reckon the restores will, will fix it. There's, uh, it would definitely be useful in other kinds of outage, um, and we have used it for um, yeah. where we've changed infrastructure and just uh, need, need service owners to update their, their specifications, etc. Yeah. There, there's one, one slight challenge with using, using something like ECR. So we use ECR as a container registry. We think it's amazing. Um, uh, I'm not getting paid for AWS <laughs> to say that. We just, it's been so robust after using other container registry products that we have to run ourselves in the past. But the one problem with it is it's got the account ID in it. So if we were going through an issue where there was a regional failure or, or an account problem, um, particularly with, with cells, each region is a separate account we would maybe have to do a mass change of the account ID. 
Um, we would love to see that getting changed in AWS. Um, yeah, Jason. Uh, I have two questions, I think. Uh, the first one is, have you performed any change on Argo after that? Because we had a similar situation like one month and a half ago, but it was only on the environment. Uh, and it was with the first service that we started our developers to deploy with Argo. So during the first week of deploying with Argo, they changed <laughs> the name of the namespace. Cool. With same situation, more or less, and and they destroy all the <laughs> dev environment. So, nice. so we we did disable um, auto prune um, and. Uh, I can't remember the name of the uh, cascading autoprint. Um, so it, it, now um, th that does mean when we do, when we make a change, that means we have to delete things or uh, clean up objects. It, it does mean we have to, at that level, we have to go in and, and manually manually trigger the prune. Question over there. Yeah, my question was, how did you recover the stateful sets? So it, we didn't. Uh, we, we, well, we, we put the stateful sets back in place, but we had that conversation about it, the only stateful sets we have running are Prometheus and Thanos. And we went, well, Thanos is, uh, has shipped the longer term metrics to S3. Um, and we, we had that conversation of going, it's, it's metrics, we don't care enough to restore it for time where the site has been down. We know the site has been down. We don't need Prometheus metrics to tell us that. Um, so we, we just didn't. And what did you do with the databases? I mean, maybe you use a database to run all this stuff. Uh, the, the, At the, some point, I mean. The, the databases are, are RDS. Like it's an AWS, it's AWS managed services. We don't run databases on top of Kubernetes, so that that data was never touched by the the fact that we'd, we'd wiped out all these services. Hi. Hey. Have you had actually an outage from a malicious actions of someone? And if so, how did you recover from that? <laughs> cool. Good. Sorry. Good. <laughs> no, I mean we, we've we've wargamed it. We've done it um, at a high level with our CXOs and talked about all the the situations and scenarios, put them under a bit of pressure about making decisions. And then from a technical perspective, we've also talked about um, walking through a scenario and then discovering more and more problems and going actually this might be malicious rather than a failure, um, and and then figuring out what's going on from that. Um, with that, there's a really good game day. I, I'm, I honestly I don't work for AWS, but there's a really brand new, uh, new game day, which the teams maliciously deal with one another. So that's quite a good one. And that's quite a fun, fun one to consider other failure states. But we've never had that. Right, folks, it's yeah. roasting up here. Maybe we we'll meet you for beers. Thank you very much for your attention. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks.